Hmm? Class is on Zoom today. My professor's out of town. You want me to, I can turn down the brightness some, I think.
All right, I'm going to get started. So today's lecture is on frequency response. And like I said in the previous lecture, what that is, is just, uh, it's just basically you take the transfer function, h of s, and you evaluate it at, uh, along the imaginary axis. So this omega here is a, a real number. And so what that corresponds to is if you were to think of your h of s in the complex plane, so this is the real axis and this is the imaginary axis, the frequency response corresponds to evaluating it along the imaginary axis. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, I'm going to go over the last few slides of previous lecture because uh, I was running out of time and I kind of rushed through them and I didn't think I made a lot of sense when I was talking about why the relevance of resonance. So I'm just going to go over that really quickly before we get started. All right, so last lecture, we kind of talked about this simple circuit where you just have a current source and then there's a resistor. And then the question I posed to you was how much energy goes uh, is delivered to the resistor. So why do we care about this? Well, this resistor could be your phone, could be anything. And so we want to deliver some energy to it to charge it. And so if the resistor has a resistance of 2% of 0.5 ohms, in this case it would be the admittance would be two. And the amount of power delivered as a function of time, the average or the absolute value of it would be equal to the voltage times the current. But we know that the current is just the voltage across the resistor divided by the resistance. And so we can just plug that in to get that the power is just the voltage squared divided by the resistance in this particular case. And what we get is that the uh, current source has uh, delivers about uh, the the current source delivers about two cosine squared t um, uh, power density per unit of time. So that's kind of a, a simplistic example. Now, a lot of circuits with them, they have associated with them some kind of a capacitance or inductance. And so this might be your feed circuit or like what your charger looks like. And then you are connecting this resistor and you're trying to maximize the amount of energy being delivered to that resistor. And so you have no control over this circuit here, basically, that's what I'm trying to say. And, uh, but you do, you can control, or, or yeah, you have no control of the, the circuit and you need to deliver some energy to this uh, load. And so that's where resonance frequency comes in. But at this point, you can't really have a resonant frequency because you only have one uh, non-resistive element. But let's just look at what the output energy of this particular circuit is into this resistor. So to do that, you need to kind of uh, derive what the equivalent uh, admittance is, which is two plus J one. So it's just one over R plus J omega C. And then the voltage across the resistor will be actually the current inputted divided by the admittance. So it's just a current divider. And so now we get that the voltage across the resistor is just equal to this. So all, all I'm trying to calculate this is this IR and I'm doing a current division to get the value for the voltage across the resistor. Okay, so that's not really like the, the main thing. Like um, the main thing is that now if you actually plug in this voltage along with uh, the current going through the resistor, what you will get is that uh, the value of the power as a unit of time actually is just two fifths. So this is actually less than the two cosine T. And so if you just design your circuit, you just put your load, you kind of uh, get less energy 
be delivered to your load. And if this was a phone, that would correspond to having longer charge times. And so you're trying to kind of figure out, well, what's kind of what can I do to make this better? And so what you can actually do is insert a inductor in series with your resistor. And what you're going to do is design this inductance so that it gives you the a resonant frequency equal to the source resonant frequency. Oh. How did you go from the absolute fraction to two fifths? Okay. Uh, here. Oh, yeah. So this, if you actually do the absolute value, it's just nine plus 16, which is 25. And then you have to do the square root. And so you get a five on the numerator because the absolute value of this is this basically. And so then it becomes five over five, which just becomes one, two over five. All right. Yeah, but the, uh, I guess the arithmetic is not that important. That's why I'm glossing over it, because the point here is mostly that the fact that there is this capacitor means that you get less energy delivered to the load than you did with just the resistor. And the goal in uh, what what resonance, uh, the resonance frequency, what ends up happening is that the effect of the capacitor gets canceled out and you maximize the amount of power delivery to the resistor, basically. That's kind of the main significance of it physically. But let's just go over this example really quickly. So let's say let's say uh, I need to find the admittance of this particular circuit. Uh, what would that be? So what do we have here? All of you can talk, it's fine. Uh, so So basically I have this resistor in series with a resistor so i have basically one over s l plus r and then that's in parallel to a capacitor so plus s c equals y in oh what oh okay now you can unmute yourself And then this should be J omega, and then this should be J omega. Uh, yeah, so that's basically the admittance of this uh, particular circuit. And then it's asking us to find its imaginary part. So to find the imaginary part, we have to basically multiply the denominator and the numerator of this quantity by its complex conjugate. So that, what that's gonna give us is that Y in so if omega is actually equal to j omega c plus r minus j omega l over r squared minus plus j omega, or sorry, r squared plus omega squared l. Omega uh, squared. So all I did to this is I just multiplied it by R minus J omega L and then R minus J omega L. So when I do this, this times that, I basically do J omega L plus R J omega L negative plus R. So that gives me omega L squared plus J omega L minus J omega L R J omega L R plus R squared, which is just omega L squared plus R squared, which is what I have here basically. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the admittance of this, and then what would be the imaginary part? 
would it be this part and this part or this part and this part? So the first one or the second one? Option two. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's option two. So basically you have that the imaginary part of Y in, so if omega equals J omega C minus J omega L over R squared plus omega L squared. Cool, so that's basically it. So now that we have this for resonance, we just have to find the uh, L or we just have to find basically the omega, sorry, the omega, this should, all of these should be omega Rs, that gives us zero frequency. And that's how we find the resonant frequency. So let, now that we know this equation, let's say we wanna design L to give us an omega R or resonant frequency of zero. So, sorry, of one. So what we would have to actually do is just plug in that to our circuit. So J omega, or sorry, J one times L divided by what's R squared 0.25 plus L squared plus J times one. There should be a C here times one. So it's clear to everyone how I got this. This has to be equal to zero. And then it's asking us to determine what L gives us this uh, value. Uh, and then, the, uh, yeah, so at this point, you can just basically do a bunch of algebra and solve for L. And then that's going to give you the L for this particular circuit. And I did that here. So basically, first, I just plugged in a uh, well, actually, I did it symbolically. So I basically plugged, I solved the quadratic equation. And then I plugged in the value of one for omega and one for C so that I would get one half here. One for C and one half for R so that I would get one four. And then one and one so that I could get one half. And then this gave me that L has to be one half. Okay, so now kind of the, 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 the pun of the story, which is that if I choose this L to be one half, let's look at the circuit again. And what ends up happening is that the, if I have this Y in, now if I look at the input admittance, it will actually be, once I plug in all the numbers, well, the, this is the input in admittance, and once I plug in all the respective numbers, so one, for the source, uh, one half for L, and then one for the capacitor, I actually get that the input admittance is one ohm, and the voltage across the resistor is actually cosine T. And then when I try to evaluate the power delivered, I get two cosine uh, T. And so, from the perspective of the resistor, if the circuit is operating at resonance, the this circuit and this circuit deliver the same amount of uh, power. And so that's, that's kind of the relevance of it, that you maximize kind of how much you deliver to your load. So that's kind of the main significance of it. And that's why we teach this, uh, Resonant frequency. Is this making sense to everyone or? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so in terms of an exam though, all you need to know is actually how to compute resonant frequencies. We won't ask you anything about energy or power or anything like that. This is just kind of so you understand why we're teaching you this. Uh, R is not one, R is two. No, the R is 0. 0.5, and so that's why 1 over R is 2. So the voltage across the resistor is cosine T. The current is just cosine T over R, and so you get V squared over R, which is 2. 
the input, the input admittance is 10. The input, so this is the impedance, the equivalent impedance of this whole thing in parallel with this thing. That's just one ohm. The resistance uh, is actually one half. But the point is, is basically that the inductor was tuned in such a way that it canceled out the effect of the capacitor. And that's what resonance really is. So in terms of choosing whether you're using admittance or impedance, typically you just do this. Uh, you do you use the one that kind of leads to the less least less uh, amount of math. There's really no rule in particular. What the resonance frequency? Uh, Yeah, so all right, let's skip that. Okay, so now we're gonna actually go into the frequency response and see how much time we have. No clock. Hmm. This doesn't help. All right, no clock. All right, uh, so now we're gonna talk about frequency response, but before um just kind of give you another reminder of phasers. So before in the, your previous class, you looked at circuits as phasers. And when you consider two things, kind of the magnitude and the phase shift of your circuit to different quantities. So you have an input voltage that's uh, cosine omega t. And then you would try to figure out how much shifted in phase your solution was and what how much bigger or smaller it was. As it turns out, uh, the phasers that you were actually doing, what you were actually computing was the uh, transfer function evaluated at the fre frequency of the input. So in particular, if you had a steady state input of cosine omega naught t, the solution that you got whenever you did this phasor analysis was actually the magnitude of the transfer function times cosine omega naught t times the phase of the transfer function. So that means that this, this transfer function actually has a lot more meaning because it's a uh, it represents the steady state solution for any cosine input. And so we can actually learn about how the system responds to different frequencies by simply plotting or looking at this uh, frequency response. And so that's why we're gonna kind of just focus on evaluating the frequency response on the imaginary axis, as I said in the first slide. Okay, so basically, as I said in the first slide, so if you have a circuit, We've learned how to uh, derive the transfer function. So basically, you take IL, you find what IL is in the Laplace domain, and you divide it by the input, and that gives you a transfer function. Well, now we will be actually substituting for S J omega, and we're going to call that the frequency response. And in particular, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to call the frequency response. So for this particular circuit, this is the frequency response. This is the trend, the transfer function. And the difference between this and this is that S became J omega and omega is a real number. That's all there is. Okay, so let's look at some frequency responses. So here you have an LC circuit. And the way the frequency response looks is that uh, the frequency response will be very small, very small, very small, very small, very small, very small, very small. And then all of a sudden near the resonant frequency, it goes to infinity. And then it falls down. That's uh, your typical frequency response of, uh, of a tank circuit. And then the angle basically goes from pi over two to, so this is pi over two, right? Yeah, pi over two. This is negative pi over two. So 90 or uh, negative 90 degrees. 
and basically until you reach roughly the at the resonance frequencies it, it uh, transitions into negative 90. Okay, so how do we plot out how do we generate these plots and how do we plot out frequency responses? So first we have to go back to our transfer functions and we know that transfer functions are actually uh, the ratio of a polynomial in the numerator and polynomial in the denominator in S. And so your transfer function will actually look something like this for any given circuit. And so its magnitude is just gonna look at like this, where you just basically replace the parentheses with absolute values, because as it turns out, the magnitude operator, um, you can associate it differently. And so you can actually go from this magnitude to input in it into the individual monomial terms. And for the phase, you actually take the, the face of the numerator and you subtract it from the face of the denominator. So does anyone know why this is true, that the face is actually this? Yeah, it's properties of exponentials. So basically, we know that uh, if we have two imaginary numbers, you know, they're going to be some uh, r. So basically, if we have in the complex plane here, r1, and then we have r2, and then we have theta1, and theta2. And so the number z equal to r2 over r1 sorry equal to c2 over c1 is actually equal to r2 e to the i theta 2 divided by r1 e to the i theta 1 but that because of the exponentials dividing by an exponential is just subtracting we have R2 over R1 e to the I theta 2 minus theta 1. And so here, all we're doing is we, we're basically applying this property over and over and over again to this ratio. And so we get that the angles of the denominator terms are subtracted from the angles of the numerator terms. And so that's how we got this formula here. And then for the magnitudes, these are just, this is just the ratio of the two magnitudes uh, that we got in the numerator and denominator. And so that's basically how we got these formulas. Okay, so that's basically, here's another like a frequency plot. And uh, this is in the linear scale. So what you can see here and what you could have seen in the previous plot is that uh, in the frequency scale, what you end up getting is that uh, for most circuits, you're gonna get that it's some value. It might actually have multiple dips. So it might go like this and then like this and then like this. But uh, for most circuits, what you're gonna get is that it's on a fixed value. And then it very steeply goes to zero as you uh, increase by a factor of 10. And so we and so these graphs don't really tell us a lot about the circuit. So we typically actually plot this on a log scale. And so uh, what we do is we introduce this whole, whole notion of decibels. So if this is H of J omega, we typically don't express it in a linear scale. We typically, and we don't draw it in a linear scale. We draw it in what's called a decibel scale. And the way you derive the decibel scale is you uh, take the magnitude of your uh, frequency response, you take the log base 10 of it, and then you multiply by 20. And that's how you go from a linear quantity to the uh, frequency response in the decibel scale. 
So here is how that circuit on the this circuit here would look in a decibel scale. So in particular, we see that this is 60. The reason is because uh, in the previous plot, we have 1,000, which is really 10 to the 3. So when you take the log base 10 of 10 to the 3, you just get 3. And you times that by 20. That's how you get the 60. Um, and so typically, we think of whenever we see 20, that's synonymous to us with uh, 10. Whenever we see 40, that's synonymous to us with 100. Whenever we see 60, that's synonymous with 1,000. Now, the, the main kind of reason we do this de decibel scale is because, as you can see here, uh, when you look at a simple circuit like that, you actually have a very nice linear slope. Uh, as you, in the, in the decibel quantity, as you move down the, uh, as you increase each individual uh, by, by a factor of 10. So we can see here that we move down by a factor of negative 20 dB decibels for this particular circuit as we uh, almost linearly, as we increase the frequency by a factor of 10. And so actually next lecture, not this lecture, what we're gonna actually do is develop a way to plot these uh, frequency responses or approximate versions of it. And the way we're gonna approximate them is basically by a straight line. And then it starts to fall with a constant slope of 20 decibels per factor of 10. Uh, and that the way we're gonna calculate the slope will have to do with how many poles or zeros are to the left of that given frequency. Uh, but we're kind of talk about that next lecture. Now we're just going to actually derive the formula for these things. And then next lecture, we're actually going to go over the drawing. OK, so is everyone kind of with me? Are there any questions? All right, no questions. What time is it? All right, so people are still with me. Oh, have some notation. What's the question? Parenthesis is equal to. What do you mean the parentheses equal to J omega C1 minus C2 minus C3? No, oh, okay. So here it's more like J omega. Yeah, I think you're right. So basically if omega is three, this would be J. And let's say the zero is at uh, four plus J5 or negative four plus J five, then you would basically have that the quantity in this parentheses would be J three minus four plus J five. But then the magnitude of it would actually be, oh God, so it would be four squared plus eight, squared square root so this eight is actually just three plus five so it's just the magnitude of whatever's in the parentheses that's what the notation is saying that makes sense i guess okay. i think that's what I... um 
Okay, so I was asking more about like in those bottom summations where you have JW minus Z sub K. Yeah, yeah. When you're doing that summation, would you do it as in like JW minus Z sub one minus Z sub two? Or would it be JW minus Z sub one plus JW minus Z sub two? I guess uh, that's going to be answered in the next slide, I guess. Or So basically, this would actually be log 10 of JW minus Z1 plus log 10 JW minus Z2. And of course, all of this has to be. And then so on, basically. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. OK. Uh, on that note, I guess how we derive this formula actually is because this, right, is just really an expression that looks like this, 20 log base 10 A times B times C times D divided by E times F times G. And that's actually equal to 20 log n of a plus 20 log of b. And then you add them all up. And then you have minus 20 log e minus 20 log f minus 20 log g, basically. So we're just using that property to convert these products. into sums that's really all we're doing uh we're, we're just we're using this property over and over and over again until we kind of get rid of everything so that's basically what we're doing all right so to approximate the plots we're actually going to do an approximation here and kind of i'm gonna derive it with you it's a it's a very crude approximation so let's say uh, the zero, in this case, I'm calling a capital X, is a thousand. Okay. And let's say omega is equal to one. 20 log 10 of 1001 is approximately equal to. Or I guess here, here. Oh. Omega plus X, where this is just one, and this is a thousand. Yeah, it's approximately equal to 60. So basically, since this is so small, the omega, you can just approximate this as 20 log 10 of X. So basically, what we're going to say is that whenever omega is less than x, not even a lot less, actually less than or equal to x, we're just going to say that 20 log base 10 of omega plus x is approximately equal to 20 log base 10 capital X. So note, this is a very rough approximation, but it's good enough for our purposes because we're trying to understand the global picture. Uh, and it actually only deviates in a little region from the actual answer. So basically, whenever omega is less than x, we're going to say that this whole expression here is actually just uh, 20 log of x. That's what we're going to replace it with. And then on the other side, kind of by similar argumentation, whenever omega is greater than x, we're going to say that uh, this thing here is approximately 20 log base 10 of omega. That's going to be our approximation. So basically here, I kind of draw it. So whenever omega is less than x, we have that this is 20 log x. And whenever omega is greater than x, we're going to say that this is 20 log omega. Um, 
so just uh, just let's just try to plot this out. So let's say omega here, let's say x equals one. And let's say, yeah, so let's say x equals one. So here, let's just say 0.1, one, one uh, 10, 100, then 40. Uh, Actually, 20, 40, and 60. So what would be its value at omega equals 0.1 if we use this approximation? So remember, we were trying to plot 20 log of j omega plus one. So if omega if omega is point one, is it less or greater than x or one? Less. Yeah, so it's less. So basically we have to use this expression. Uh, and since it's one, the log base 10 of one is just equal to zero. So we have basically that it's going to be zero at point one. Uh, but then for any value less than omega, it's going to be zero. So we can just. Now at 10, what would be its value? So if omega equals 10, what's the value of this expression? 10. Twenty. Yeah, it is twenty. Um, God, where is this? Okay. So it is twenty. So now basically it's going to go up to twenty, and then what's going to happen at a hundred? It's going to become forty basically, because then this becomes basically when since. 10 is greater than uh, 1, we know that then the expression actually is approximately 20 log omega. And so it's just going to increase basically log base 10. At every factor of 10, it's going to increase by a factor of 20. So that's, that's kind of the approximation that we're going to do um, to plot these things. So um, here I actually went through an example. So let's say we have this transfer function. Uh, which is basically s plus 1, s plus 10 squared, s plus 100 squared on the that plot. Oh. oh, so that here, basically, the y-axis would be 20 log j omega plus 1. And then this would be the omega. Um, yeah, that's what that's what the axes are on these plots. So we're just I'm just plotting this. This is yeah. We're gonna be doing this all next lecture, so I wouldn't worry too much if you don't get it because that's that's next lecture's material plotting these things. Now I'm actually just going mathematically at what when we're plotting at the approximation that we're actually making. Uh, and it's it's a very crude approximation, but it turns out that actually gives you somewhat accurate plots that give you a very good idea of what the circuit's doing. So that's why we use them. And they actually give you somewhat of an intuition for the circuit, uh, but okay. So let's look at this transfer function. So here we have S plus one in the numerator, S plus 10 in the denominator squared, S plus a hundred in the denominator. So when we take the 20 log of this thing of the, frequency response, we're going to have 20 log s plus 1 minus uh, 40, because there's a squared here. So that's why now it's not, if there's two of these. So now it becomes 40. And then uh, log 40 times log base 10 of j omega 10. And then minus 20 log base 10 uh, of uh, j omega plus 100. 
And I initially was going to derive this with you, but I must have deleted the slide. So I guess we're just going to go over it with the answer right in the front of us. But OK. So let's assume that omega is less than uh, 1. OK. What, how would you approximate this if omega is less than 1? Is it just log base j omega or log base log 1 times log 1? Based on our approximation, basically, that we said that we're going to use. What were the values of j omega or of omega and? Omega, we're assuming omega is less than 1. So which one do you pick, the 1 or the j omega to keep? You keep one of them whenever you're doing this approximation. 1. Yeah, so you keep the 1. Let's go. Then you keep the j omega for this one because it's greater. You keep the j omega for this one because it's greater. Sorry. Sorry, you keep the 10 and then you keep the 100 because the 10 is greater and the 100 is greater. So that's how we get this expression here. So whenever omega is less than one, we're always using this approximation for each term. Then between one and 10, now this omega is greater than the one. So now we actually replace that here. And then the rest, omega is still less than 10 and omega is still less than 100, so those stay. And between 10 and 100, this one's still greater. This one still, this one now becomes uh, greater. And I should have an extra term here, 40 log omega. I, yeah. And then here the 100 stays. Question? Oh. What do you mean they dropped out? Oh, th this was a mistake. There should actually be a 40 log here, negative 40. It shouldn't have dropped out if that's what you're asking. Okay, maybe not. Okay, and then for the, when omega is greater than 100, uh, basically we're just gonna say that if this is just equal to J omega, because it's greater than one, j omega because it's greater than 10, j omega because it's greater than 100. So this is how we're gonna approximate it. Of course, this is not correct, but it's close enough for our purposes. So for the last one, it should have three terms, but it's uh, they all have a log base 10 of omega. So you have negative 20 minus 20, sorry. Oh yeah, this is this is actually correct. Sorry. Okay, I apologize. Okay, here you have twenty, and then you're subtracting forty, and that's why there's a negative twenty here, in the log omega ten term. And now at this point, since they all have a log omega, it's really twenty minus forty minus twenty, which is just minus forty. Yeah. So. That first term for omega is less than or equal to one would correspond to the flat part of the graph. And then we would see slopes for the other parts. Yeah, yeah. And this is actually a linear slope of 20. And then this would be a linear slope of negative 20. And this would be a linear slope of negative 40. And so we can basically start from here and just go left to right. So we plot something constant. Then there's a 20 slope. Then there's a negative 20 slope, then there's a negative 40 slope, and that's how we're going to plot it, basically. Uh, but that's that's next lecture. Right now, I'm just trying to kind of tell you where we get these uh, approximations when we plot it. Yeah, and maybe we have time. Yeah, we have five minutes. We can try to plot this and then call it a day. Okay, so let's let's try to plot this. Okay, so... So this is actually going to be, what is the log of base 10 of 1? It's just, uh, so remember that 10 to the 1 log, so this is x log x. It's just 10 to the 0 will give you 0. 10 to the 1 will give you 1. 10 to the 2 will give you 10. 10 to the 3 will give you 100. One wait, sorry, whoa, 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 
yeah, two and three and so on. So what is this? So log of 10 to the zero, which is just one, gives you zero and then log base 10 is just one. And then this is just two. So we have here negative 40 minus 40. So that's negative 80. So negative 80. And then, uh, yeah, so it's negative 80 from up to one. So this could be 0 0.1, 0 0.01. Okay, so straight shot up to here. All right, so now we uh, we have the slope. So now we have basically, so this is one, two, uh, and then we have a slope of 20, so 10, 100, 1,000, so this is 60, negative 40, negative 20. So now we move up by 10. From here to here, we move by 20 because that's the. Uh, and then in the next part, we actually move down by 20 per thing. So we're actually going to go back down here. And then here, we're going to fall down by a factor of 40. So this is 100, and this is 120. So we have to move down to 120. It just becomes a steeper slope. And that's our plot for the frequency response, basically. Uh, yeah, question here. Oh. Should the third row still have a third term going off the inequality third row? Yeah, so I combined the omega terms. That's why there's a negative 20 here. So you'd have 20 minus 40, which gives you 20, negative 20. Yeah. Could we, you go ahead. Could we extrapolate this graph beyond frequency of one thousand? Yeah. So it just keeps going down at a, as a fact. What we say, we say basically, it falls down forty dB per decade. So per factor of ten, it's gonna keep going, keep going down by a factor of negative forty dB decibels. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so that's basically, actually ne next class, we're actually kind of focus mostly on these graphs and we're also kind of plot phase. Um, they, the book doesn't really go over this approximation. They just kind of tell you that, they give you kind of a signature and they said, say that uh, this signature, we're just gonna add all these signature waveforms and then that's how you're gonna get these plots. But I think that this might be a little bit more straightforward because that's really what we're doing. We're doing this really crude approximation of the for each individual term in the frequency response and then that makes the plotting really easy because you're just basically looking at either a constant and that tells you the value kind of near the origin and then there's kind of a bunch of state transitions and then it's just like a line plot in each sub region but yeah that's all i have for today i will see you all on uh wednesday Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Have a good Monday. You too. Bye. Hello? I got a question. Oh, dang. Oh, I thought he ended. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. What's the question? Uh, can you pull up the uh, slides real quick? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm still a little confused about the graph. So why do we start at a negative 80? Oh, I just make that the origin because, okay, so if you look at this number here, it's just zero, this is one, this is two, so 20, oh, sorry, negative 40 minus 40 is just negative 80. So that's why it should be a flat line at 80 because for omega less than one, this thing is at negative 80. Mm, all right, that makes sense.
And then if you look here though, if I plug in one, then this is zero. This is negative uh, 80 still. So it matches, but then as I keep increasing omega, this value is gonna start changing linearly or it's gonna increase by a factor of 10 every 10. So that's why there's a line here going from here to here, from one to 10, this increases by a factor of 20. Mm. And uh, here they, add, they, they will also match, the expressions match. Uh, and then here we have kind of the, a slope of negative 20. So you will actually start falling by a fact, slope of 20. And then you fall by a factor of 40. Mm, okay. And that's just off like the omegas, like in the different ranges. Yeah, the omega terms. Uh, ne next, next, next lecture, I'm actually kind of not even use a lot of this. I'm just kind of teach you a graphic way of doing this. Uh, which is mathematically equivalent to this. It's just, you don't, you don't need to really write this. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, okay, I get you. Approximations. It's just that I think that this is, we, we, we typically show the heuristic and we don't really explain the math behind it. And this is the math behind the heuristic. Mm, okay. Okay, so uh, I had another term. term. I know. Well, I Sorry. 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 You're good, no, no you're good, you're good. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, no, you're good, go. All right, thanks. Uh, in the third term, um, in your piecewise function, isn't yeah. the, the negative 20 log 10 of 100, wouldn't that be negative 20 times 2 and negative 40? Yeah. So then that doesn't, wouldn't that not match up with negative 80? Or I guess negative 60? Negative 60 is where we're starting out going from 10 to 100, but we're, that value is negative 40, right? Okay, so this is negative 40, right? Yeah. But then omega is 10, so this is negative 20. So it is negative 60. I thought that's like our change because it has the omega. That's like our slope. Well, well, the, this is the value of the function at each point in, in uh, omega. So if I plug in negative 20, so if I plug in 10 for omega, right? I have to plug in 10 here if I want to evaluate this thing. Okay. And so that gives me basically negative 20, negative 60. Just like here, oh, I have okay. to plug in one at this point for omega. But then from then forward, this stays the same. So we don't really have to worry about it. And what really changes is this. So that's why we just move down. Okay, I see. Thank you. At this transition point, again, you basically have to plug in 100, which is two, and then you get negative 80, basically. Right. So it matches, okay. and then you just work, but but it's always gonna match because the our approximation is consistent, right? Here, we're plugging X, and then here we're plugging omega, but the transition point is X. So really, if I have put an equality here, it doesn't really matter, right? Because if yeah. a equals x, so it's always gonna match. So you don't. So, so that's why you don't even go through that logic. But it is the case that everything uh, that it does the the approximations are continuous. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I had another question. If no one else had a question. All right. Go for it. Last question, and then I have to go. All right, all right. Uh, so it's like still on the slide. So on like, I think Zach may have already asked this, but on like where it's between one omega, like it's between one and 10. Like, so if for omega, like or omega or for the first term, it's gonna be omega when it's bigger than one, right? So if it's like two, three, four. So then when you say like 20 log 10 of omega, what do we take omega to be in this case? Do we look at it for like each value? Like we look at it for one, two, all the way up to 10. We're trying to plot this as a function of omega. So omega is a parameter that we vary. Mm -hmm. So really we're plugging in 0.01, then 0.1, then 0.1, then 0.1. We're plugging in all these numbers basically. All right. So we're going left left to right typically because we basically start, the more left you are, the, it's gonna, at the very left, it's always gonna either behave as constant or it's gonna behave linear. There's a zero at zero, which is the, sometimes the case. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which complicates things a little bit. Okay, I think I got you. All right, so I'll see you all later. Bye. I'm gonna share these slides, even though I know I haven't been sharing the annotated slides because I think I put a lot of notes on this ones that are not in the original slides. So I'll see you all later. All right, thank you. All right, bye.